started. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Tara Teal. I'm a professor in the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department. And this is the second talk. Sorry. I'm a little ahead of myself. <laughs> this is, yeah, right, right. This is the second talk in our seminar series on human wildlife interactions. And this is a series, for those of you who couldn't make it to the first one, that is jointly being sponsored by the Human Dimensions of Natural Resources Department and also the Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology Department in the Warner College of Natural Resources. Um, part of the emphasis of this seminar series is not only, obviously, to bring in some exciting speakers, uh, but also to look at ways we might further our collaborations between the departments and beyond on human wildlife issues. Um, today, I'm really pleased that we have Chris Smith. Um, Chris Smith is currently the Western Field Representative for the Wildlife Management Institute, um, which is a private nonprofit organization dedicated to conservation, enhancement, and professional management of North America's wildlife and other natural resources. Earlier in his career, Chris spent 23 years with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game in various positions, from a fisheries technician to the assistant director of wildlife conservation and also 11 years as the Deputy Director of Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Through his professional experience, Chris has developed a keen interest in the public trust responsibilities of state fish and wildlife agencies and principles of good governance, which he'll talk more about today. <coughs> Chris has a bachelor's from the University of Alaska and a master's from the University of British Columbia. And I will mention that Mike Manfredo and I have had the pleasure of working with Chris now for a number of years. Um, primarily through initiatives with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, or AFWA. And Chris is involved in some really innovative work currently with the association to try to look at how agencies can remain relevant in the face of social and cultural change. And so today he's going to be talking about some of the major challenges that he's been witnessing over his career in contemporary North American wildlife management, and also talk about some of the things that he's involved in that are inspiring efforts for how we might address some of these challenges. Um, so after our social today, or after our presentation today, I welcome you to join the social that will be right next door. And we'll have time at the end of Chris's talk for question and answer. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Tara. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to start off uh, with a bit of an apology. Um, when. Uh, Tara asked me to come down and, and give this presentation, and I was frantically getting ready for the North American session. Uh, we threw together this title, and I wasn't sure what the right preposition was to use here. So if you came here thinking that you were going to hear about challenges to wildlife management, like ballot initiatives or things like that, that's not, what I'm, that's not the kind of challenge to wildlife management that I'm talking about. And another preposition might have been for, challenges for wildlife management, but as you'll see as we, as we go through this, um, you know, there's, there's some overlap among all of those things. I want to start out, though, by telling you uh, about two sort of uh, experiences that, that I had um, that kind of bookend my career at, at this point that I think illustrate the, a point that I'll try to make through the course of my, my presentation here today. First of all, I want to talk about an experience back in the 1970s when I was a young, eager field biologist with the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. We were free-range tagging brown bears um, on the banks of the Brooks River in Katmai National Park. We'd go out in the morning and stalk these bears and shoot them with a dart gun, and when the drugs took effect, we'd go take measurements of them, put a radio collar on them, standard sort of stuff that you know, I got into this business to do. Um, but at the time, the drugs, this was in the 70s, which is ancient history, I admit. Um, the drugs we had weren't very good, and the particular drug that we were using, oftentimes the bears would have an adverse reaction to that, where they would have what, for all intents and purposes, looked like an epileptic seizure. I mean, they'd be thrashing around on the ground. It wasn't pretty. And uh, this one particular morning, we were working up this bear and it had one of these seizures and um, one of the seasonal park employees, because this was in a national park, uh, who was there was observing this and she was very disturbed by what she was seeing and she said, what would the public say 
if they saw what you guys are doing to one of their bears. And this crusty old Park Service biologist who'd been around you know, for decades before that, um, was pretty old school, had a cigar in his mouth. He took the cigar out of his mouth and puffed a whiff of smoke in her face and in slightly more colorful language said, screw the public. And that wasn't an uncommon attitude back in the 70s among wildlife managers and biologists. We kind of operated in, in that fashion. So now let's fast forward to this January. In this picture right here, I was in front of the House Fish, Wildlife and Parks Committee in the Montana Legislature testifying in opposition to House Bill 161, a piece of legislation that proposed to prohibit the Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the Fish, Wildlife and Parks Commission, the agency, from considering public opinion, public preferences, social science, or human dimensions in any decision making. Okay. That probably would have been real popular with that Park Service biologist back in the 70s, but I can tell you that at that hearing, there were two proponents, the sponsor and the co-sponsor of the bill. Then there was two hours of testimony with each speaker limited to three minutes, so you can do the math and figure out the number of opponents, and they ranged from avid hunters to the people who had organized an unsuccessful ballot initiative last fall to ban trapping on public land in Montana. And they were universally in agreement that that piece of legislation was a bad law, a bad proposed law, because public opinion, and public values, human dimensions and social science is now viewed as critical to wildlife management and is widely valued by people across the spectrum. So that's, those two things sort of bookend and, and illustrate a transition that, in, that I have certainly experienced in my career. So what I want to talk with you about today, um, I want to first of all touch on a couple of definitions uh, so that when I use terms like wildlife management or the wildlife management institution, which is different than the wildlife management institute, we have a common understanding of, of what I'm talking about. I'm going to briefly go back through some history uh, of wildlife management uh, in North America. Share some perspectives that I have on contemporary challenges that the institution of wildlife management faces. Discuss some ways that I think the wildlife managers can respond to those challenges and best deal with them. Um, and some of what I'm going to throw out here is likely to be fairly controversial. And I hope it stimulates some discussion, uh, stimulates some questions in your mind. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up with um, a challenge that I'll throw out uh, for all of you. But before I do, before I jump into that, I do want to say thank you to Tara for uh, inviting me here, uh, Wes, for taking care of all the travel arrangements uh, to get me here. Um, to the colleagues that I've worked closely with over the last few years, in addition to Mike and Tara, Dan Decker from Cornell, <coughs> Ann Forstian from Florida, Mike Chavon from New York, um, Pat Letterly from uh, Michigan DNR. There's a, a small group of us that we collectively refer to ourselves as the Skunk Works that are focusing on issues of public trust, agency governance, uh, transitioning, uh, helping state agencies in particular, but the conservation and wildlife management institution more broadly adapt to the, the changing environment. Um, and I, I also want to thank, you know, the literally hundreds of people that I've had the good fortune to work with over 43 and a half years now, I guess, in, the, in this profession. It's, it's been exciting. Um, but I take full responsibility for anything I say that um, is either wrong or very upsetting for you today. So. so let me start off with when I talk about wildlife management, um, to me that's the process of making decisions and implementing actions to affect interactions between people and wildlife and habitat to achieve 
desired outcomes by people or outcomes that are desired by people. And I use this in a very broad context. Many people, when they think of wildlife management, you know, tend to think of a very utilitarian, narrow uh, approach. And in fact, um, it, it's my sense that the conservation biology movement arose from the, I'll say, reluctance uh, in the traditional wildlife schools and wildlife profession to embrace a broader role. But to me, even conservation biology is about achieving a desired human outcome. It's the desire to conserve species and to maintain biodiversity. So when I talk about wildlife management today, I'm, I'm speaking in a, in a very broad context, meaning all of the things that uh, are done, the decision-making processes, and the actions that follow from those that affect uh, people, wildlife, and, and habitats. And when I talk about the institution, I'm talking about the collective of the customs, practices, policies, agencies, organizations, laws, this amorphous mass of uh, effort that is directed at uh, conserving wildlife or taking other actions to provide benefits to people uh, from, from wildlife. So, any questions on those? All right. So let's just run briefly through a couple of stages in the history as, as I see it, and I only lived through about half of this, so. Um, uh, the history of wildlife management uh, in North America. And many people, I think, perceive that the wildlife management and conservation movement really began in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And the initial focus was primarily on halting the decimation and unregulated take of wildlife. People could see what had happened with bison, with, other, with many other species, what unregulated market hunting was doing to, to waterfowl, had done to many of the plumage birds, and so forth. And so the initial effort and focus was on implementing laws to stop those practices, to implement protections for certain habitats, for certain species. But a, but a huge part of that initial effort was overcoming the public perception that resources were endless. Um, that was a big lift for folks like Gifford Pinchot, Theodore Roosevelt, the, the champions that we think of in that, in that era, era was turning our society away from this sense that wildlife and the land was boundless and we could just run roughshod as, as long and as far as we wanted to. So that was sort of the first an initial period of, of wildlife management in North America. In the middle of the century, middle of the 20th century, we moved into the scientific, what many have called the, the scientific period, um, development of an application of the uh, biological sciences and ecological sciences to questions related to fish and wildlife population management. Uh, much of the effort at that time focused on restoring those species and habitats that, been, that had been so badly damaged during the uh, late 19th and earlieth, early 20th century. And much of the profession um, at that time, and much of the effort, focused on hunters, anglers, hunting and angling, trapping to some extent, and land use, in particular the way uh, rangelands, forest lands and agricultural lands were managed uh, as part of this complex of providing uh, wildlife primarily as a, as Leopold put it, as a crop for recreational hunting. That was very much the paradigm that was in place through that middle part of the, middle part of the century. But that was, a, that was a transition, an important transition from that early protectionist period where we were in, in effect doing triage and trying to save the remnants uh, 
moving to uh, a, a higher level of care, if you will, um, to where we were, were applying science to, to the management uh, of fish, wildlife, and habitats. And moving later into the last portion of the 20th century, we entered an era where it, the profession was faced sort of with this bipolar disorder, um, if you will, where on the one hand we had certain species that were abundant and in some cases overabundant, where we started seeing problems with urban deer populations or urban goose populations people beginning to complain about having too much wildlife in some places. At the same time, this was the era in which the Endangered Species Act was passed and people really began to think about and concentrate on how do we protect these species from blinking out? What do we need to do to manage in, in, the, in the case of scarcity? The latter half of the 20th century uh, after World War II was when we saw this tremendous boom in the U.S. economy and the industrial uh, impact across the nation uh, expanded. So we were having to respond to that in terms of um, protecting waterways, uh, dealing with uh, polluted air, th those sorts of things. And all of that was happening at the time, particularly for state fish and wildlife agencies, and I completely wear that bias uh, outwardly, as Tara said, having worked most of my career for state agencies. Particularly for state agencies, this was not a time of expanding budgets. There weren't a lot more people, there weren't a lot more resources, but there was a lot more work to be done. And that's a challenge that, that continues today. But one of the significant things that happened in the latter portion of the 20th century was the recognition the role of human dimensions in wildlife management. The recognition that the expert model that had been so effective and so successful during the first two-thirds of the 20th century, where <coughs> trained experts could sit down in a room, look at data, analyze that, come up with a solution, take that out and roll it out and expect to be able to carry it forward, that was fading in the rearview mirror quickly. And so as a profession, we began to embrace, and I suspect Mike and Tara would agree that it was reluctant at first and still has a way to go, but it began to embrace this notion of incorporating social science and human dimensions and expanding our public engagement, public involvement processes into the decision-making portion of, of wildlife management. And, and that was a, a significant uh, development from my perspective. <coughs> now throughout this time, throughout history, and, and uh, it's certainly the case today, the profession and wildlife managers have been faced with both technical and adaptive challenges. Okay? Technical challenges t are those ones that <coughs> tend to be easy to identify lend themselves to pretty cut and dried solutions. You gather the data, you analyze it, you figure out what the solution is to that. Um, typically, they require change in only one or two dimensions. Um, rarely involve um, more than one part of an organization or society. And people are, have been generally accepting of technical solution or solutions, excuse me, to technical problems. And those solutions can often be implemented very quickly and by edict. Right? At the other end of the spectrum, and this is a spectrum, like all models, you know, it has flaws, so you actually have a gradient of, of problems or challenges as you, as you move from those that are clearly technical to those that are more adaptive. But the adaptive challenges are those that are hard to hard, harder to identify and they're real easy for people to deny. Okay. They require changes in values, beliefs, roles, and relationships, and approaches in order to solve these adaptive problems. They require adaptation of a system, of an agency, of a society, whatever. Importantly, 
The only way you can solve adaptive problems is by engaging people who are part of or are affected by the problem. The solution has to come from the bottom up. It cannot come from the top down. Um, often require changes in many different dimensions or aspects. Um, and uh, they can take forever to implement. It, these are not quick fixes. And if you think back <coughs> on, the, on history, through, through our history, you know, in the, in the early uh, part of the history that I talked about, you know, stopping poaching was a relatively technical issue. Congress passes laws, provides resources to enforcement agencies. <coughs> they go out and arrest people who are taking wildlife illegally. Okay? The challenge of changing people's perspective with respect to wildlife being an endless, infinite resource, that was an adaptive challenge for those early pioneers in, in conservation. Okay? I'm sure you can think of other, other examples as we go through. But <coughs> let's talk about some of the contemporary technical challenges that, that the profession faces. Things like developing a live test for chronic wasting disease. You know, it's not easy, but it's pretty much a technical issue. It's a matter of developing the ability to find the prions or the symptoms of those prions in live animals so that you can detect CWD. Identifying ungulate migratory pathways. A lot of work being done on that. We just had a great conference in Salt Lake a couple of weeks ago bringing together both um, wildlife agencies <coughs> and highway departments from 11 different states across the West to talk about how do we identify where these conflict zones are, where, where highways are blocking migratory pathways for ungulates, where ungulates on highways are causing damage and injury and death to people. You know, that's a fairly straightforward technical problem to solve. Measuring the impact of the urban sprawl on the Colorado front on carrying capacity of mule deer. You know, that takes some GIS, some maps, some understanding of biology and, and habitats, pretty straightforward. Now what you do with that information that's an adaptive challenge, okay? And then, Gary, in case you fell asleep, this was, this was the one that I threw in there for you. Um, improving statistical analysis and population modeling. You know, that's, that's a fairly straightforward uh, technical, technical challenge that we face. And these are all, it, these, and, and we could go on and list many, many, many more. more. They are all important, and I'm grateful that there are brilliant people working on them because we need to solve many of these. But if we only concentrate on this and we only address these technical problems, I'm afraid that, that we will not be successful in the long term in conserving um, our fish and wildlife resources. I think we need to spend considerable time dealing with the adaptive challenges that we face today. One of those is the declining number of hunters and anglers and the effect that that has on revenue, particularly for state agencies. For better or worse, state agencies have had the benefit <coughs> of a long-standing relationship with hunters and anglers and through the, the um, federal Pittner-Robertson and uh, Dingle-Johnson cash flow have provided a stable source of revenue for state agencies. But that source of revenue uh, is declining. And the long-term prediction is that it's going to continue to go down for a number of reasons. Um, that's an adaptive challenge that st certainly state agencies face. Meeting the demands of an increasingly diverse society with often contradictory demands or interests in wildlife is a tremendous adaptive challenge. You know, 50 years or more ago, when the primary focus of wildlife management was on meeting the needs of hunters and anglers, was a narrow constituency, 
there were you know, sometimes ugly fights over whether or not you should be shooting doe deer or not, or whether you should be implementing predator control or, or not. But you had a fairly narrow f field to play in. That is no longer the case. You now have much broader interests, much more diverse society, and it's, and it's becoming more and more diverse um, all of the time. So that's an adaptive challenge. How do we, how do we uh, pro accommodate all of the beneficiaries who have an equal stake under the public trust that, that government holds the uh, fish and wildlife in. Resolving conflict between those competing interests is a huge adaptive challenge. Maintaining or regaining public trust. The graph that I've used in a, in a presentation that I, that I give on public trust and the importance of maintaining the public trust, both as this ancient doctrine and, and maintaining the public's trust as, as a modern imperative shows that trust in, in government uh, has declined rapidly over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, I only half jokingly say that those of us who grew up in the 60s, our mantra was don't trust anybody over 30. We haven't changed that. We still don't trust anybody over 30 and probably don't trust many under 30. Uh, so. There's, there's a lot of distrust in government and in this increasingly polarized political environment that, that we're operating in presents a huge adaptive challenge for, uh, for us as an institution, for state agencies in particular. Dealing with nature deficit disorder, I mean, the increasing disassociation of particularly children with nature um, is, uh, has some long-term implications for wildlife conservation and wildlife management. And then finally, um, overcoming bureaucratic inertia, I entrenched systems, policies, programs. Um, at the North American, when I was speaking on, on um, Mike and Tara's panel, I pointed out that um, you know, bureaucracies are designed to do the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, they're really good at it. Once you get a bureaucracy in place, it will carry forward on a, on a particular path um, unless there's a major force that, that shifts it. And I suspect this is true in the, the bureaucracy of a university as it is in a state agency or, or, a, f or a federal agency. Um, at the same time, the definition of insanity is what? doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. So if we continue to do everything the way we've always done everything, then chances are we're not going to be very successful at dealing with, with these adaptive challenges. So what has the response been? Well, before I get to that, let me, t let me take just a few minutes. Um, in thinking about these adaptive challenges and how we might best address them, I think we want to start by asking, where are they coming from? What's creating these adaptive challenges for, uh, for wildlife management in North America? And I think the work that uh, Mike and Tara and others have done uh, looking at, at, wildlife, at wildlife orientation, wildlife values, wildlife oriented values, did I get it right? Whatever. Um, I got it, close enough. All right. Um, I mean, the, 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 and other human dimensions work that is evaluating changing demographics, okay? changing lifestyles, the increasing urbanization of our society. All of those things are leading to changes in values, declining uh, representation of utilitarians within our society, increasing uh, proportions of, of mutualists. You know, these are things that are not going to turn around. This is not going to change. This trajectory is not going to reverse. And we can, as, as an institution, we can put our heads in the sand and ignore that and say, no, we, we, we liked it back in the 70s on the Brooks River when you didn't have to worry about what the public thought. You know. But that's not going to help us. We are not going to solve our adaptive challenges unless we face up to the fact that this is real. Okay? So how has the institution responded? 
Well, on the one hand, um, and, and I want to give credit particularly to state agencies for the work that they have done on recruitment, retention, and reactivation, what's commonly referred to as R3. This is a concerted and increasingly focused and sophisticated effort to recruit, retain, or reactivate hunters and, and anglers. And I'm fine with doing that. I think that's an important uh, component of what, um, what the institution does. But it's focused to date primarily on traditional constituents and, con and, and traditional interests in the motivation of maintaining that revenue stream from hunters and anglers and shooters that has supported state agencies. I list this as being important but insufficient. How many of you have been trained in CPR? Most of you? Okay. In, in my other life, I'm a ski patroller and an and a, uh, outdoor emergency care instructor, and so I drill this stuff into the, the students that I, I teach. You know, when, you're d when you're doing CPR, you have to have an airway, you have to have breathing, and you have to have circulation. If the air isn't going in and out and the blood isn't going round and about, something bad is going to happen to that person. You have to have the complete package. I see recruitment, retention, and reactivation, the R3 efforts, as one part of what state agencies need to do. It's important, but if that's all they do, they're just hanging on to a smaller and smaller piece of the pie. Okay. A couple of years ago, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies organized a blue ribbon panel that brought together a diverse range of folks, uh, chaired by former governor of Wyoming and Johnny Morris, who's the CEO of Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's now, had folks from industry, conservation NGOs, state, federal agencies, to look at what do we need to do to sustain America's diverse fish and wildlife resources over the long term. They came up with two key recommendations. One was to, to broaden funding through uh, what has now uh, been proposed as Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So that's a way to reduce the dependence on a narrow segment of the, of the public for the majority of financial support, particularly for state agencies and in my view, to more equitably spread the cost of wildlife management and conservation across all of the beneficiaries. That's the other problem I have with states that are focusing just on the R3 model is, in, in my view, that is an, un, an inequitable way of funding conservation. Everybody has a stake in conservation, whether they hunt or fish or not and everybody can and should derive benefits from wildlife management and accordingly everybody should have a financial stake in it. So that, that was one piece. The other part, uh, the other recommendation was that agencies transform programs and their and agencies to engage and serve broader constituencies. That is the focus of um, quite a bit of work over the past decade and, and what I hope is accelerating now. And I see this as being critically important to the success of broadening the funding. There's you know, sort of this ongoing argument within agencies as to whether we provide broader programs to meet the needs of non-traditional constituents before they pay for it. Um, or how do we do that before they pay for it versus, um, you know, the public saying, well, why should, we, why should we support you financially when you're not doing anything, anything for us? Somehow we have to get beyond that um, uh, catch-22. So in terms of what agencies can do to address this, this second piece, in my view, one of the important things that agencies can do is to adopt a more inclusive governance model, one that truly focuses on managing all wildlife for all people, 
that leaves none out and importantly leaves none behind. Okay? And this, that latter point is extremely important as, and as Mike and Tara and I were talking about earlier, that's a real, a real tough nut for state agencies that have had a long-standing close relationship with a uh, constituency, hunters and anglers, who in many cases feel threatened by any effort to broaden the tent or uh, invite others to the table. Um, and if we have time, maybe we can get into some further discussion about how you might address that. But I think it's essential that we make it clear that what we're doing is broadening the programs, not shifting them, not abandoning traditional constituents, but finding ways to engage with additional partners. In terms of what that model might look like, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the Skunk Works group that I mentioned earlier uh, published a paper um, that proposed a set of wildlife governance principles. And we develop those by thinking hard about public trust thinking. What are the key components of this philosophy, public trust thinking, that under, underpins the public trust doctrine? And what are modern norms for good governance? What do people expect of government today? And how can we weave those together into a framework that provides guidance for decision-making and implementing actions that affect people, wildlife, and, and habitats. Through the course of about two years, we developed a set of ten principles. They're general normative statements, very process-oriented, as opposed to um, you know, what's often referred to, it, particularly, again, in state agencies, the North American model of wildlife conservation which talks more about outcomes and less about process. These principles are really designed to provide guidance for how agencies can, uh, can operate. And they focus on strategic thinking and organizational adaptability using evidence-based and broadly informed decisions. Being inclusive and diverse in your decision making and program delivery, being transparent and accountable, and increasing the capacity for conservation through partnership and, in, and broader engagement. We took these principles out, proposed principles out, and worked with uh, four state agencies, uh, one in each of the, one in the west, one in the midwest, one in the south, and, and one in the northeast. Um, and worked with them to evaluate their programs and use that as a way to develop a tool that other agencies can use now to, to measure the degree to which their programs and their practices, the traits of that agency, align with these ideal principles and identify ways that they could change their programs to come into better alignment with those, with those principles. Um, we've since used that tool with uh, several states, and they've also found that the principles are very helpful in setting strategic direction for the future by helping them keep in mind the, the fundamental requirements of public trust and modern expectations for, for good government. The other thing that um, we've found uh, that, we're, that we're working on now with a, with a group of about 60 to 70 people from various agencies across the, across the country, as well as representatives from NGOs, academia, um, and, and in industry circles, is what we're referring to as the relevancy roadmap. And what that focuses on is the barriers to engaging and serving broader constituencies. So we sat down initially with a smaller group and, and fleshed out a, a proposed approach where we break down these, this challenge in the, into manageable bites by looking at what is it that is preventing 
the institution and particularly state fish and wildlife agencies from engaging and serving broader constituents. And after a couple of days of brainstorming and, and coming up with some ideas, we, we really identified five sort of categories of barriers. Those deal with either agency culture or agency capacity, constituent culture and constituent capacity, or legal and political constraints that, are, that create barriers to engaging in, and serving with, with uh, broader constituents. And just to give you an example here, um, in terms of agency culture, and, th and this is something that shows up clearly in the, in the values work that, um, that uh, came out here recently, agency culture and values do not align with the culture and values of broader society. Particularly, again, within a state fish and wildlife agency, although they, over the last decade, I would say things have gotten somewhat better, there is still, when you look at the demographics, the culture, the values of people working within those agencies, in many cases, they are not aligned with that, those of the general public. That creates a barrier. Anytime you have to work across that sort of cultural difference, value difference, that creates an obstacle. And so what we've done in the second phase of this now, having gone through and, and identified these barriers, is start to develop some broad strategies that might be useful in overcoming those barriers. There's another example. In terms of constituent capacity, for many people, particularly in, uh, in urban areas, um, in minority cultures, there are very real economic, cultural, and social impediments to engaging in nature, and to engaging with the agency to, to getting outdoors. So what are some strategies that, that might be useful in that, in, in that circumstance? Providing local and affordable opportunities to engage with nature. You know, um, the, the people in nature study that um, Dave Case hit it up here, you know, when they were asking about, you know, when people think of being outdoors and out in nature, you know, for many people, particularly in urban settings uh, in a minority cultures, to them, that's a trip to Glacier Park, you know, which is never going to happen for them. But we can bring nature into the cities. And we've had discussions about the importance of inner city habitats for migration of butterflies and, and other insects. How can we integrate that into the awareness and thinking and, be, and behavior of people in, in the cities? Okay. Legal and political constraints. Agency decision-making processes are used and influenced by a limited number of people. Anybody that has spent half as much time as I have in commission meetings in a variety of states knows you see the same people show up at, at every meeting. And we have to broaden our decision-making processes to engage other, other people, bring more views to the table, and do that in constructive ways, not simply have People, people beating on each other. So the Relevancy Roadmap project is, um, is in development. We've gotten to the stage of uh, refining barriers, identifying broad strategies. Over the next four or five months, we'll be focusing with these various groups of people on developing tactics and metrics that we can apply so that we'll have ultimately have a framework from which states can pick and choose in terms of how they overcome their barriers. And like any good roadmap, you know, this has to offer multiple routes because the situation in California is totally different than the situation in Wyoming or North Dakota. Okay? They are starting in very different places in terms of what their socio-cultural environment is, what the needs for change are in those places. Um, you know, and so a path that to California might look like a, like an interstate and one they want to jump on and, and go down in a hurry to begin to engage this huge Hispanic population uh, with, within California, you know, that sort of a path, that might be a real dark alley uh, 
to somebody in Wyoming, you know, that represents a, a place that if they try to move in that direction is going to create some real political difficulties for them. So we want every, each state to be able to choose their own path and set their own pace, but we want to lay out some concrete steps that that state can take if it looks at this roadmap and identifies this is a barrier for us that we can take on and, and start to move. So that's, that's where we are. We expect this to be completed by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies meeting in September, be presented to the 50 state directors there for their review and, and hopefully their adoption. Okay, I said at the outset I was going to th throw some controversial stuff out here. So here it comes. There's this group of us that are starting to have some discussions about the next transition in terms of what is included explicitly in our thinking and our decision making and our actions as we implement wildlife management. And that is ethics. That is to be explicit about ethics. This is going to be uncomfortable for some people until they really think about the fact that every decision that is made, every wildlife management decision that has ever been made, involves ethical dimensions. Decisions have consequences to people. They have consequences, certainly have consequences to the animals if you're talking about whether or not that, that species is, is hunted um, or, or taken by fishermen. They have impacts on people's freedom to do things as well as people's free, freedom from certain, certain impacts. Okay. Um, whether the decision-making processes or how, how decision-making processes are carried out involves eth ethical issues related to fairness, both of the process, and then in terms of the outcome, when, when management uh, hits the ground, those outcomes have ethical consequences as well. They, have, uh, they influence human welfare and well-being, animal welfare and treatment, harm, cost, risk, impacts to future generations, all of those are ethical factors that come into play in virtually every decision that we make. But here to date, we generally haven't been very explicit about ethical trade-offs or ethical impacts. And I think one of the things that as a profession we are going to have to do is be much more transparent and much more explicit about the ethical elements. Because as values diverge, as people with different values, which result in different ethical considerations or different, different perspectives on ethics, become more and more engaged, whether that's through a process that the institution facilitates or through a ballot initiative, uh, if the institution doesn't provide any other means for people to express those, those views. Um, they, I, I just think we need to, to recognize that that's, that's a part of the equation. So moving forward, this is sort of what I see as, the, as a, a more holistic model for wildlife management, where decisions are informed by the biological and ecological science that has been the foundation of wildlife management for over a century. That's rock solid, we gotta have that. At the same time, we need to have valid social science and effective public engagement because as managers of the public's trust, we have a responsibility to all members of the public to hear them, to treat them with respect, to consider their interests equitably as, as trust managers to sort that information as best we can to make the, the, the most, the best informed recommendations we, excuse me, we can to the trustees, those elected and appointed officials who, who are the final decision makers. Um, but I think it, it, 
ultimately, um, we will be better served if we can also begin to incorporate ethical considerations. And in, along that line, um, part of the Skunk Works group um, is undertaking a project now where we're trying to categorize these ethical factors that commonly come into play in wildlife management decisions and provide a framework, uh, not quite a uh, dichotomous key, but some sort of a tool that managers could use when confronted with a decision to think consciously through things like what are the consequences to to people? What are the consequences to wildlife? What are the different stakeholders' ethical perspectives on these so that we don't walk into buzz saws um, unexpectedly, as can happen? So, in, in wrapping up, I said I was going to um, offer a challenge uh, to you all. And, and that challenge is basically is to think about some of this stuff, and as you move forward in your careers or interactions with, with other folks in, in your work as part of the institution to reflect on some of these adaptive challenges that we face and think about the, think about the role that you can play. And in closing, I want to take you back to the Brooks River, but not in 19, mid-1970s when I was there. I want to go way farther back, back when the Yupik were the only people that were on the land on the Brooks River. And the oral history within the Yupik culture said that, says that when a young Yupik man wanted to prove his fitness as a leader, he would go alone upstream from the village in the fall when the river was full of salmon and the bears were concentrated along the banks. And he would fashion a spear, crude spear, from a green sapling that wouldn't break easily, put a cross piece about halfway up that sapling, and then go pick a fight with a brown bear. And it was a fight to the death. Okay? And when the bear charged, the young man would plant the butt end of that spear into the ground and drive the point of the spear into the bear. Okay? And I'm sure what ensued was pretty lively. Um, high risk. Um, and if the young man was successful in killing the bear, then he would take the hide from that bear and fashion a sort of a crude bull boat out of that and float back down the river to the village. Pretty risky business, okay? Very uncertain when that young man headed out, headed up the river, you know, there was no guarantee he was coming back or that he was going to be successful in that, in that venture. There's no guarantee that any of you or any of us will be successful in addressing these adaptive challenges that I talked about. There is risk involved. There will certainly be blowback. There will be pressure not to rock the boat. But if we don't take those kind of steps and we don't push the envelope a little bit, we will never make any progress on these issues. So my challenge to you, my final question is just to say the opportunity is now. What are you going to do? Thank you. Yeah. And I guess I'm the only thing standing between you and you and the refreshments, <laughs> but but if there are questions, I'd be glad to answer. Try to anyway. I got to call on Len first because I wouldn't be here if he hadn't retired and created the vacancy I'm in. So go ahead. Chris, I think one of the things that's really key there, and you know, and I know from being a long term of the state agency, the dichotomy between the agency and the board or the commission. The commissions are all 
politically appointed, and they see a whole different world than a professional manager would. So I wonder, in, in your discussions, how do you try to get that solved uh, with state agencies? Good question. And for the in, the, in the relevancy roadmap subgroup that's working on the legal and political constraints, um, that particular question has probably taken up um, half, the, half the discussion time. Um, half of the rest has been taken up by the question of what do you do given the, the, the average tenure of an agency director now is down to less than two years? I mean, how do you implement institute change within an agency when the person that sits at the, at the top desk you know, is going to be gone in less than, less than two years. But to come back specifically to that, I mean, we recognize that there is that, that difference and disconnect between the, the trustees, politically appointed individuals who are accountable more directly to the public than, than uh, agency staff. Um, and a couple of the ways we've talked about trying to address that, one, you know, the, the more ambitious within the, within the group, talk about efforts to change the laws in terms of how commissions are structured. Okay. Um, we've tended to stay short of that point because we're focusing on what's within our sphere of control. What are the things that that we can change without having to engage in the, in the broader political process. But to some extent, in, in some cases, and I don't, I'm not sure about your Parks and Wildlife Board here, but in many of the Western states, you know, that the representatives are identified as, well, you gotta have a rancher, and you gotta have a farmer, and you gotta have a th this, that, and the other thing. So, um, you know, it may require some changes in, in, in the statute. But I think the other thing uh, that you can do that's within, uh, within the sphere of control of, of folks within the institution, two things. One is to uh, instill interest in people who are problem solvers, broad thinkers, um, in, in being willing to serve in, in those capacities and work with uh, the Typically, it's the governor's office that, uh, that makes those appointments to get the governor's office to understand that political patronage is not the best way to, to populate a board that, that is going to have the responsibilities that, that it does. And then the other thing, and, and I've been involved in this in a number of states, is developing programs where you actually sit down with commissioners, particularly new commissioners, and you talk with them about their responsibilities as trustees for all of the public, you know, and, and help them understand and appreciate what it is that, that they've taken on in, in taking that position. But again, that's an adaptive issue that's not going to be fixed quickly. Yeah, Peter. So I think that your ring, your your Venn diagram at the end is is an eye and I think it. But I think the key piece of it is we're at, we're at a bottleneck now from a genetic point of view, and the question will be whether in fact we can get through that bottleneck um, with more openness, um, without undermining the any confidence in the institutions. And I'm thinking particularly about. These agencies have, again, should have for years selected for abundance at the expense of wildness of wildlife. And in fact, these are, what we're getting at now is how we select for wildness. And that will, that, that will have challenges on both sides. But how do we sustain um, the confidence of the public at the same time we own the fact that we put a lot of wildlife behind fences and fed a lot of them and did a lot of things that undermine um, wildlife as wildlife? Mm -hmm. Um, if I can broaden your question a little bit, and it, this comes to something that, that Mike and Tara and I were talking about earlier today, because um, I think that the, the practical or the, the 
the tip of the spear that, that you're talking about here is, the, is this issue of how do agencies maintain the confidence and trust of, the, um, of their traditional constituents, that particularly the hunters and angler, anglers, while em embracing broader responsibilities in, in engaging with, with, with other folks. And um, the model that I've, I've used in my head and, and tried to think about a way to uh, communicate is um, how many of you in here have kids? Some. How many of you more than one kid? Okay. Do you remember what happened when you got pregnant the second time? Did your first kid say, oh, yeah, this is great, mom and dad? No, I'm sure that there was some, wait a minute here. I've been the sole kid on the block here. I've had mom and dad's undivided love and attention and everything else. And now all of a sudden, somebody else is going to be sitting in my high chair. Somebody else is coming to the table. I didn't have a say in this. I don't want this to happen. I'm going to throw a, throw a temper tantrum. Well, child psychologists have identified a number of ways that parents can facilitate bringing a second child into the family. And I think there's a number of parallels that, that state agencies <laughs> could use. Um, and that's not to say that hunters and anglers, and I am an avid hunter and angler, okay, that, that, that they are acting like first kids in any sense other than the fact that to a large extent they have had a very close and exclusive relationship with state agencies. So that's where the, that's where the, the parallel comes in. So one of the things that child psychologists suggest is um, don't disrupt any routines of your first child when you bring the second child home. So if, if you haven't potty, your, potty trained your first kid when you bring in the second kid home, that's not the time to start potty training your kid because they're already you know, uncertain about well, how their relationship is going to change and now all of a sudden you're making them do something different. So from a state agency standpoint, don't fundamentally change programs and services that you've been delivering to those traditional constituents as you broaden this out. Continue to provide the key things that, that, that they are, are interested in. Um, another thing they talk about is encouraging your first child to engage with and help develop their, their younger sibling. Hunters and anglers have a tremendous legacy of conservation, contributing to conservation uh, of fish and wildlife in the, in the country. It's a story they should be proud of. And it's a story they should be facilitated to share with other people who are interested in conserving fish and wildlife. Okay? Um, going back to the first point about not being disruptive, one of the things I've constantly urge states to do in thinking about broadening the constituencies is um, don't wait until you've got a crisis to bring people to the table okay, from, di from different interests. I've had to do that um, when I was managing wolf control programs in Alaska and, and wolf management for the state of Alaska. A um, little controversial topic. Um, you know. We, we successfully worked through that by bringing a, a broad range of people to the table, but I'll tell you, it was, it was painful at the start because we were trying to build trust among people who came to the table with deep distrust of, of each other. So if you can start to bring people together around things like habitat restoration projects, who can be against restoring damaged habitats? You know, you're much more likely to be able to bring a diverse array of people together, work on a project like that, develop those relationships, get to know each other so that eh, you're not that greenie from the park service that I thought you were, you know. You're, you're actually a pretty decent guy and I can work with you on, on this, or that or the other thing. You know, um, we saw that going back to the, to the wolf uh, example that I was talking about. The, the Wolf Council that I brought together in Alaska included uh, a young woman who was executive director of the Alaska Wildlife Alliance, the most outspoken opponents to 
wolf hunting, trapping, wolf control programs in the state. And the individual who probably shot more wolves using his airplane every winter than most of the rest of the state, everybody else in the state put together. And when they walked into the room, they sat on opposite sides of the room and just glared at each other. By the third meeting, Valerie and Chuck would s deliberately sit side by side. They chose to sit next to each other at the, at the table when we were having discussions. And whenever we were dealing with a tough issue, if Valerie and Chuck got into a side conversation, we all just kind of sat back and let it go because we knew if Valerie and Chuck could agree on a solution to a particular issue, we had the spectrum covered. And they were able to do that because over the course of time, they came to recognize each other as individuals and develop that, that mutual respect. So I think anything that agencies can do to begin to facilitate those interactions among those folks uh, would be helpful. Yes? I'm wondering if the big elephant in the room might be funding. If you think back in history, Aldo Leopold in the first North American Game Policy talked about cooperation with various constituencies. He talked about bringing in non-game management. Uh, but never since the Pittman Robertson Act, the Daniel Johnson Act, have we been successful to get a funding mechanism to help promote other interests. It's been tried many times. A couple states have managed to get a sales tax, but it's, there's really no money to do some of the diverse activities uh, that's out there, and that's been a, a huge element. It, it has, and um, as is often the case, and I, you know, I reminded my kids of this many times as they were growing up, your greatest strength is your greatest potential weakness. And the strength and reliability of that funding stream from hunters and anglers and shooters through the, through the PR has been incredibly important to state agencies. But with that security, there has been less motivation to go out and pursue some of these. And it's, it's become, in, in some cases, I think a crutch uh, for agencies. We've got we've to figure out how to do that. States have tried yeah. uh, unified efforts with your organization, tried to get large yeah. national- Teaming with wildlife, right. And, and, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Um, the, the biggest question that's been raised um, in, the, in outreach to Congress uh, through the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies today has not been opposition to the idea. The question has been, okay, what's the offset? You know, if we're going to redirect this federal funding to this program without raising the budget, whose ox is going to get gored? So that's the, that's the challenge. We're out of time, but I just want to thank Chris again um, for being here today, and also thank all of you for coming, and again to our department chairs, Catherine and Mike, for sponsoring the seminar series. And stay tuned, we do have two more talks coming up next month. Um, we have Joanna Lambert um, coming from CU Boulder, and we also have uh, Dwan Biggs from Griffith University, both next month, so we'll send out flyers on those. So if you have time, join us for the social next door and continue.